The Motorsport Advancement Crusade presents Motorsports Unlimited. Hi, I'm Joy Theus. I'm Cameo St. John. I'm Lyle Ann Seeger. We would like to welcome you to Motorsports Unlimited, Part 165. Today we're going to take you to a community car show in the lovely suburb of Oak Brook Terrace. While summer car shows have become enormously popular, the Oak Brook Terrace show held at the Oak Brook Square Shopping Mall was extra special. That's right, Lyle Ann. This show was sponsored by the community and all of the city officials were involved. From the mayor to the police department, everyone played a role. Let's begin our show by chatting with Mayor Richard Sorello, who's more than just an Oak Brook Terrace mayor. He's also a contestant. Well, we cannot start doing the Oak Brook Terrace Car Show without once again reintroducing ourselves to the mayor and the person that's probably most responsible. This is Mayor Dick Sorello. Am I saying it right, Dick? You got it right. Welcome once again to Motorsports Unlimited, and I am delighted to see that you really do have a uh, uh, Dodge with a six-pack. I do have. Uh, how is the show going today? I think it's going very good for the early part of the season already. There's a lot of, probably a lot of fellas that don't have their cars ready, and... Probably our next show will be somewhat bigger even. Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm really surprised at the turnout you have here. It looks really colorful. you got to admit you got lucky on the weather. Yesterday it was cold and raining. Well, we passed an ordinance at our last meeting, so we would have good weather. Well, you know what else? You know, I was thinking about the other day. I said, if I ever get to name a town, and assuming they're not going to let me name it Wiltville, I think Oak Brook Terrace would be my next choice. That is really a pretty name. I wonder, did you get any thought going to that? Well, this goes back a number of years ago uh, when the... Uh, community was formed. It was called Utopia, which is probably the name that the town really is, because uh, we have so many amenities here that it is a sort of a utopia. Yeah, it really is. And plus, just the name Oak Brook Terrace. I mean, I <laughs> it is a pretty name. Now, instead of all that, tell us a little bit about your car. Well, it's a 1970 Dodge Charger, uh, 446 pack. It's one of 116 made. Only 116? 116. It's all original? It's uh, all restored original. Uh, was it taken down to the frame or was it in good shape to start with? Well, it was basically in good shape and then it was all restored from the rust uh, areas and uh, totally cleaned up. Do you have any other cars in mind you'd like to get your hands on? Well, I'd like to probably get a nice Hemi. Oh boy, who wouldn't? Now I've got to ask you about one other thing. Uh, just step right over here, Mayor. Keep right on going. I'm sure I'm making, this is good right here, I'm sure I'm making this a tough deal for our cameraman following us. Uh, this is yours? This? Oh, this is my lady friend, yes. I like her because she doesn't say too much. <laughs> I want to say that uh, apparently the mayor of Oak Brook Terrace has a sense of humor. I sure hope so. I mean, that's part of life. Yeah, it really is. Uh, anyhow, uh, now come on back over here. I want you to meet somebody. Right here. Mayor, this girl's name is Lee Chin. Lee Chin, this is Mayor okay. Sorello. Yeah, glad to meet you. Lee Chin just joined our program last week. She's from Inner Mongolia. She's only been in this country for a year and a half. This is what we call in this country a politician. Do you know what that is? I think so, I guess. I'm learning now all about this. Okay, well, he is the mayor of Oak Brook Terrace, which is the town that we're in right now. And I wonder, here's a challenge for you to call on all of your oratory skills can you explain to Lee Chin what a mayor does in our society? A mayor is responsible for everything, good and bad. And he's the leader of the community. Uh -huh. So it's a multifold job. Many, many things make sure the welfare of the community, the welfare of the constituents, and the business people. They make it all possible. And we're very glad to find out that we have a mayor that also can get a car show together, right? Well, I didn't only do it. Uh, we we have a committee with uh, Alderman John Valley, who sort of was his basic idea, put it together, got a committee together, and they they worked hard to put it all together. Right. Well, we're going to be talking to those folks in a second. But from your perspective as a mayor, what do you think? Worthwhile venture? 
Oh, definitely. I think that has brought a lot of people to the community. I hope it's good for our business people here. Okay, great. Listen, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us. We're going to cover as many of these cars as we can, and we're going to talk to the committee. Uh, what do you think? Nothing to be afraid of, right? Yeah, it's really <laughs> great. And uh, I think it's really great to see you uh, certainly be with the people here, to see our community people, because that reminds me of in China. If you're an officer, you're always, you're always very formal. You go anywhere, you, you show your officer. But for you, you know, you're just, if she wouldn't tell me you're mayor, I wouldn't know you're mayor. You, you actually have to be a human being, be, be part yeah, a mayor also. Yeah. Well, anyhow, thanks once again. We're going to check out the rest of your show. I really like what you put together here, and I hope it works out very well. Don't go away, folks. We're going to be right back. It's nice to find city leaders with a sense of humor along with their administrative skills. Certainly, our Lee Chen was impressed to find that officials in this country are approachable. Before we go any further, let's take a moment to meet the girls that did the location work for this edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Hi, I'm Tracy O'Toole. And I'm Lee Chen. I'm Angie Kay. I'm Marilyn Schwartz. And I'm Subi Itzendaler. We mentioned that the police department was also involved in putting this show together. Let's meet the man that first contacted us and take a peek at his very special supercars. Well, it certainly looks like we have a new applicant for one of our Crusaderettes. What do you think, Angie? <laughs> Pretty cute. <laughs> you think she'd look good? Um, Tell me, Lee Chen, what do you think? You think she look good in one of our costumes? Yes, I like it. <laughs> I you know, it's the first time I really touched a dog like that. Well, I, we better find out something, though. Uh, is it a male or a female? Female. Oh, it would look, be just appropriate in our costumes then. <laughs> first of all, let me introduce this um, person. I guess you would say the, the dog's master. Is that close enough? That's close. Or the other way around? Uh, it could be either way. <laughs> okay, you are, I'm going to try it. Chuck Nussbaumer? That's correct. I got it right. Yes. Okay, you happen to be on the police force of Oakbrook Terrace? That's correct. I'm a lieutenant. Okay, and you were the person that originally contacted us? That's right. Okay, what do you think? You guys have done a lot of work here. Uh, we just got done talking to the mayor. He's apparently very pleased. Uh, what do you think? You pleased? Uh, I think it things came off wonderfully. I, I'm really surprised it, it came off this well for the first time. Yeah, I am too. Particularly, I think it's really taking a chance doing it this early in the season. I do too. <laughs> Just like that, okay. Yeah. Anyhow, now, uh, can you talk while you're holding the dog or you want to put him down? Um, yeah, I can put her down. She won't. Okay, because what I want to talk to you about is I am really surprised. I like to find policemen like this because I think maybe I'll get a sympathetic ear if I get stopped sometime. Uh, <laughs> the cars that we're standing in front of, these are yours. That's correct. Tell us what you're leaning on. Uh, 1964 Chevrolet Impala 409 400 horse four speed car. Okay, uh, they made two, two versions of the 409 that year. Uh, they made the 400 horse single four barrel carburetor and the 409 409, or was it the 425 409 that year? Well, they actually made three. They made a 340 hydraulic lifter car, uh, 400 horse uh, solid lifter car, and a 425 horse solid lifter car. This is a 400. Right, the 0909 we're talking about, I know, was 62, maybe 63 also? Yeah, partially in the 63, I believe. Okay, and then they went to the 425 horse. Now, very few people remember this, and we're going to be boring some of our younger viewers, I'm sure, but I remember them having a 409 version that wasn't 409, it was 425 cubic inches, but it was still the 348 block. Do you recall that one at all? Um, you'd have to ask my expert over there, <laughs> Bob Morton, who knows all about 409 cars. I don't know for sure. Okay, because I nobody remembers it but me, but I, I could remember it wrong. That's quite possible. Now, this one is yours, but this one is also yours. What are we looking at here? Uh, it's a 1963 Pontiac Catalina uh, two-door sedan. It's a, a 421, 370 horse, four-speed car. It's got 7,000 original miles. Come on over here with me, Chuck. If you can just follow us around with the camera shot, or if we're walking through it, one or the other. This young woman is Tracy O'Toole here. Hi, Tracy. And uh, I want you to know, Tracy O'Toole is just 18 years old, and I was trying to explain to her before, if she was 18 in 1964, how important would it be to be in this car? Uh, very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the time, um, in 63 and 64, it was, uh, you know, uh, muscle cars were a, an important part of a young person's life. 
Absolutely, and as a matter of fact, somebody had something like this, and I want to point this out, and I, I'm going to have to guess, uh, Chuck, I, I need to know if we can get a camera shot that this is a two-door sedan. Is there any way you can get that at all? You want me out of the way. Okay, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, again, when we explain these things to the younger generation now, it's very hard. They're used to cars like Trans Ams and things like that, and it's very hard to explain to them that at the time of the real supercars, what we wanted was the lightest body, cheapest model with bench seats and, and uh, literally rubber mat floors to have the lightest possible body, and in Pontiac, that was the Catalina, right? That's, that's correct. This car was originally bought as a race car, and it was raced for four years, and it was bought as the cheapest model with the biggest engine and all the performance parts. It's very similar to the car next door. Absolutely. Now things have changed since then where the, the cars that are the more powerful cars and everything now have bucket seats and consoles and all that. But that's quite that's quite different from the from the original. Sure. Yeah, they're now they want all the options on them. Then you didn't want anything. And this is a bare bones car with uh, performance options. Well what do you think Tracy if a young man was trying to impress you now, would this do it or would you have to have bucket seats and consoles and all that? Oh bucket seats and consoles and all that. <laughs> you're, you're not used to this at all? No not at all pretty nice though, isn't it? Oh, I think it's really nice. It is. Okay, uh, let's check in with the other girl on the other side and see if we can uh, persuade her on uh, this vehicle. Marilyn, what do you think? 409 Chevy, have you ever heard of one? Um, no. <laughs> you, you're kidding, you've never heard of a 409 Chevy? Of course I have. <laughs> okay, uh, this, this, is a, this is a very rare piece. Now this was already when the tastes were kind of changing. This is already fairly late because we're talking here, this is what, a 64? That's correct. All right, in 64 already the guys were starting to look at Impalas and, and things with, uh, with, this one's got bench seats, but with bucket seats and consoles with high performance engines, right? Right, this is an un it's sort of an unusual 409 64 car. Most of them would be super sports and they have power steering or, or other options on them. This is just pretty bare bones also. Or it would go the other way around and the guy would have strictly a two-door sedan, Biscayne, four-speed, but that would probably be the 425 409. Right. Okay, now I understand you've got some mid committee members with you. You're more than just a participant in this show, that you have you were one of the people that put this thing together. That's correct. Where's the rest of your committee? Um, I see one over there, this guy Maurice. Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, folks, don't go away. We're going to be right back, uh, and we're going to gather up this committee and talk to them a little bit about how much work it was to put this thing together. So don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. It's all Greek to me, but helping us understand what these things mean and their importance is what Motorsports Unlimited is all about. Now let's join Bill and the girls as they meet the folks that made this car show possible. Well, we have rounded up probably the most important people at the show today. Uh, Chuck, am I right? That's correct. Why are they the most important? Uh, the people here are the ones that actually set this up. Exactly. They're the ones that have done all the work to make this possible, and I'm going to go one at a time. If you can give me your name. Steve Metz. Uh, Steve, what's your involvement? Well, I'm the one that worked up the t-shirts and the jackets, which we haven't got yet, but uh, we've uh, worked. Good job. Yeah, you betcha. <laughs> I worked hard at it. <laughs> hey, we got shirts, and we all look good. You, you really do, and this is a real nice show that you guys have put on. Now, Mayor, of course, we cannot pass the mayor, even though we've already talked to you. Uh, everybody seems to be of the same opinion. This is working out great. There's no question about it, and these people are responsible for it. There is a little bit of question out here. There are murmurs out in the crowd that they are concerned that there's a certain blue charger here that's going to walk away with top honors. I don't think so. I'm not doing any judging. <laughs> you don't think your position is going to have some influences on their decision? It never has before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you are? Uh, John Valley. John, you're the person. Now, we had the mayor on our show a couple of weeks ago, and you're the person. He gave full credit, so you must have done a lot of work here. Uh, I haven't done a thing, no. No, I have. I, uh, I'm the chairman of the committee, and I just organized the whole thing. It's, it seems pretty easy. And what do you think? And, and, and let, me, let me tell you the reason for my question. Uh, our show, we like to encourage motorsports of all kinds of motorsports activity. I can't think of anything more important than having community involvement in these things. If for only one reason, there are lots of other reasons, but if only one reason that some of these folks that work so very hard on these cars get a little bit of pat on the back from the people in their community and all that, that in itself is of great importance. And, you know, we do an awful lot of work in dark garages for hours and hours and hours. Sometimes it's nice to get a little pat on the back. But from your perspective, what do you think? Well, I, I, 
I think the community should get together with everybody else. I mean, these cars are beautiful out here. I mean, we actually have a number of cars out here that did come from Oprick Terrace. Uh, we, our main, main goal is to attract people from out of town, which uh, if you look around, we do have a lot of cars for, they're from Indiana, Wisconsin. Yeah, a ton from Chicago. A ton from Chicago. Okay, anyhow, a great job. You did a great job. And I want to re re uh, tell our audience again, the mayor did give you all the credit in the world for this, so you must have really worked on this. And you are. My name is Guy Maurice. And Guy, what's your involvement? Well, I've been involved in uh, many car clubs and car shows in the area. I'm kind of an outside advisor to these fellas here. Uh, in, in regards to what? Into, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the small details about car shows, how to park the cars, and maybe where to park the trailers sometimes when the cars are trailered in. And just little, just little small details that might come up from time to time. So you have the expertise as far as the nuts and bolts of putting a car show on, and it's not easy. It's not easy at all. We just put one on with my club a couple of weeks ago, and it's uh, very time-consuming. There's a lot of planning that goes into it. Okay, it really is. Now, you've met the folks that have put this thing together, and I want to say one more thing. We're going to be doing a lot of car shows this summer, and the reason, quite frankly, is the car shows have become something of a phenomena. There are literally more car shows than anything else going on at stock car races or what have you and I kind of want our audience to know about these things obviously I'd like to see a lot more and let me step out of camera shots here obviously I'd like to see a lot more of all kinds of things going on but I am interested in the popularity of the car shows this has gotten to be a real big thing so folks we are going to continue to look at the car shows I'll step out of the way so you can get a look at these folks that made it happen that made this particular show at Oakbrook Terrace possible don't go away we'll be right back <laughs> Our political system must be absolutely bewildering to Lee Chen. <laughs> As it is to all of us. Now let's meet a longtime viewer of Motorsports Unlimited, Bill Morse. And his friend, Judy the Car Hop. Hi, and now we're going to take a look at a very fine pickup truck. And your name is? Bill Morse. And you're the owner of? Uh, 1955 Ford F100. And you did all the restoration on it? Uh, me and a bunch of my friends. How long did it take you? Uh, about three years. That's, considering how much work they are, it's, that's not too bad. Um, I was saying before, since I paint cars, I noticed right away, got great, great shadow flames on there. I really like them. Uh, a friend of mine that works at Ford uh, did that painting for me. He did it in about uh, three months. Real intricate work on the flames. A lot of work. Yeah. They're very nice. Um, now we're going to drag Bill in here and he's going to complete this interview. Nicely done, Subi. Bill, I didn't get your last name? Morris. Bill Morris, our audience should know that you have been in contact with our show for probably about a year now. Uh, yeah, about a year. Uh, and you come from where? Came in City, Illinois. Right, way, way south, and you came up, uh, when, when you heard we were going to be at the Oakbrook Terrace Car Show, you came up just to be on. I sure did. Okay, what is most famous about your truck and when you display it? Judy the Car Hop. Can we turn it around? Sure. <laughs> I don't you want to do that, Bill? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> Carol's, what do you think? We better stay away from this guy. <laughs> hey, yeah. Um... When we talked on the phone, I didn't realize that so much was done to this thing. Digital Dash, uh, did, I don't know if you went through the list, I didn't hear from, what else have you done here? I've got a 429 engine in it, with a C6 transmission, a 9 inch rear end, it's got an oak bed in, the, in there, Digital Dash, recessed antenna. How much of the work did you do yourself? Uh, I'd say about 50% of it. Okay, when we were just talking before, when you introduced yourself to me, I was surprised to find out that, you know, we just did the show on Circus, the Circus, I keep saying junkyard, they called it an auto parts recycling place. Right. Uh, give us an idea. Uh, what did you, you go there apparently? I go there all the time. I get door locks, door handles, brake assemblies. About, I'd say about 10% of the truck here come from Circus Auto. Yeah, it's, it's quite a place, isn't it? I mean, very, very special the way they do it there. That's the only place I know of in this area that does it like that. Right, you were mentioning in California there are a few of them that way. There are a lot of them like that. You go in there, pay 50 cents to get in, and you get all the parts you want out of it. 
Yeah, pretty special place. I was very impressed. Well, listen, I am glad we had an opportunity to finally meet you. I've got to check in. I keep checking in. We've got a new girl on our show. Uh, step on out here, Lee Chen. Lee Chen, does this make any sense at all to you whatsoever? Not really. I have never seen a thing like this. Uh, you were saying when we first met you less than a week ago that you didn't really have any cars in China. Yeah, we don't have uh, uh, private cars for everyone, but we do have some taxis and cars belong to the co company or the places you work. Okay, well we're going to talk to you a little bit more because I want to sort of explain in America, we do more than just use cars for transportation and cars for doing work. We literally celebrate the automobile, but there's a real good socio-economic reason for doing so. Now, you were just saying something else you found out, that the girl next to you talks? Yeah, I found this. Um, the owner just told me this girl talks. No, this is what we call a masher. He's oh, just, masher. That's okay. what we call a masher. He's just kidding you. He'll be standing here for hours. <laughs> Folks, we've got more cars to look at. I hope you enjoyed, what do we call it, Judy? Judy, I hope you enjoyed Judy. Uh, we'll be right back. Don't go away. It was nice to meet Bill. And Judy. <laughs> After having talked on the phone several times. Now let's look at an exquisite early Ford sedan with a Chevy engine that confuses Angie Kay. Hi, I'm Angie Kay and I'm speaking with, can you tell us your name? Rich Killian. This is Rich Killian from, are you from Oak Brook Terrace? No, Lockport, Illinois. Okay. Um, we are standing here in front of his, this is a Chevy, right? It's a 1930 Ford two-door sedan. <laughs> okay, sorry. No problem. It's a Chevy powered 1978 Chevy LT1 engine. Set up camshaft, carburation, turbo T uh, 400 transmission with a BM adapter plate to it. Okay, is this a big black or a small black? It's a small black. Okay. All right, how long have you had this car? Uh, about three years. Do you do all the work on it yourself? Just about all of it. The body work too? I did the painting. It looks really nice. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's got a TCI frame. Uh, I bought the car and just restored it to get it into the shape that it is in now. Uh, it's got disc brakes. Uh, again, like I said, it's got a new carburation system on it. Uh, tilt wheel. Uh, let's see what else I can tell you. It's what they call a four bar suspension on the front. Uh, coil over shocks on the rear. It's an eight inch Ford rear end. And uh, stainless steel exhaust system. And what else do you need to know? Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about it? Well, the interior, I, I had the interior done uh, two years ago uh, in Velour, and uh, I kept with the old style, just as with the paint. This is old time paint. This is not the new graphics and everything else. Okay, I'm curious to know, um, are there different classes of cars that they're judging here at the show? Yes, there is. They, they've got about, I believe there's about 13 or 14 classes here. Uh, old cars, antiques, street rods, pro street, uh, restored cars, uh, original condition units. Okay, and what class would yours be entered in? This would be a uh, street rod, uh, converted street rod, because it has a four inch chop on it. The chop has been cut four inches. So it becomes an altered car. Okay, well it's a very beautiful car, and thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you. It would be difficult to explain or show on television just how beautifully done Rich Killian's sedan is. It is one that you have to see in person to fully appreciate. Of course, no Rod and Custom show would be complete without a 57 Chevy. That's right, Cameo. And Bill and the girls found a rare one. do a car show without doing a 57 Chevy and we're not going to do one without doing the 57 Chevy and I think we're going to start out by finding out your name first. Joey. Joey what? Leonardi. Joey Leonardi? Leonardi. Leonardi? Right. Uh, and where are you from? What town? Villa Park. Ah, Villa Park. Are you familiar with our program? No. 
Oh, you just ran over and grabbed me with the camera. <laughs> Let me talk to your dad and I'll put the pressure on you. And you are, sir? I'm Ben Leonardi. Uh, and you're from Villa Park? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we Our show doesn't air in Villa Park, but for some reason we get a lot of calls from Villa Park, so I suspect that uh, maybe unincorporated areas or something get continental cable vision. Yeah, I got continental, yeah. You do? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's how you get our show then. Uh, or, okay. Uh, tell us about your car. Uh, it's a um, body off restoration, 57 Texas, rust free car. It's uh, got the optional 245 dual quad uh, motor with uh, power glide, power steering, and power brakes. Uh, 1,100 miles since restored. Right. I wanted to mention to our audience that this is a very, very rare 57 Chevy in that it has the, in fact, until I saw it, I didn't remember that they had a dual quad yeah. uh, in the 57. I know they had a Corvette option, but I didn't know they had it in the sedan. Well, they also have a 250 horsepower fuel injected car with a power glide. Right. That I'm aware of. That's a very, very rare beast. Right. And then the dual quad power glide car with 250 horse with a hydraulic cam. Okay, is this one all original numbers match and all that? Yeah, yeah okay. totally original. Do you have an idea what something like this is worth? Uh, I say somewhere in the 40s. About 40 grand, something yeah. like that. Do you have an idea how many of these they made? Um, yeah, 57. Oh, the dual quad car? Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> it has to be less than, yeah, I was gonna say, it's got to be less than 1,000, I would think, certainly. Yeah. And, and I, I bet there's less than 100 left. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I, I have... I only know one other one around. Anyhow, yeah, do you participate in car shows a lot? Oh, yeah. Oh, you really do? You hit them all? Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot of restorations, you know. You do them yourself personally or really? Mm -hmm. uh, you have a shop? Or? Yeah, I got a shop in Addison, Ben's Auto Body, and Sun. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Sun involved? Yeah. I got a feeling this is a PR guy. Yeah, I got quite a few cars here I built. I built the 64 409. Really? The uh, white one? Yeah, the white one. I built the 57 uh, retractable over there, the Ford retractable. Um, a couple other ones around. Well, listen, uh, we're going to go on and look at some of these other cars, and we want to thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. Uh, folks, don't go away. We'll be right back. Cars are fun, but car shows have become more than cars. Almost all car shows now feature disc jockeys with a 50s theme. They add music and entertainment to the fun of getting together and enjoying the automobile. Let's meet Jimmy Mano and Bob Lafendo. Okay, we've got to stop and talk to these guys. First of all, your name? Jimmy Mano. And yours? Bob Lafendo. And what are you doing here, Jimmy? Just making it music, making it a party. Okay, this is something, I don't want to say this is new for auto shows, but it's new within the last couple of three years, at least on these uh, outdoor kind of car shows, isn't it? Yes, it is. And what, it just adds a little extra entertainment? I know the music is great in the background. That's it. Just everybody have a party, have a good time, and just listen to music, dance, enjoy yourself. Okay, and you look guys... At the, look at the pretty women. <laughs> I was going to say, you know what we're doing right now? It's like a cardinal sin. No. Yeah, we're blocking the Curl's camera shots. Oh, <laughs> you got that right. Okay, I just want to, these guys have been very cooperative all day. You wouldn't be able to hear our interviews at all. They've been nicely turning the sound down in their speaker system and turning it back up when we're done. If it weren't for them, you wouldn't be hearing any of this stuff. We appreciate their efforts, and now I'm going to slide out of the camera shot. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. All right, girls, you want to do something to the music? This is not enough room.
These guys really added something special to the atmosphere. They sure did, but I can't help but wonder why most car crews in places and car shows seem to focus on the 50s. Good question. Let's take a moment for Bill to talk to one of our newest Crusaderettes, and maybe he'll address the question. Thank you, girls. The question is, why do most of the car shows deal with a 50s mo motif? Now, I don't really have an answer to the question, but I do have an expert here that can answer the question. Lee Chin? How come most of the car shows use a 50s most motif? And not just the car shows, but the car cruising places, as you were quite aware. How come they all use a 50s motif? I think you asked the wrong person, <laughs> but I can give you a guess. I think uh, in 50s, Americans started to have a mobile, mobilized, and uh, they built lots of cars at that time, and the highway, highway has been built. And the people always think probably that's the time they start to have all of the cars. You know, that's my guess. Well, you know, that's not bad. And I think as we've explained to our audience before that you are from Inner Mongolia in China mm -hmm. and you've only been here for one and a half years, which is just a very brief period of time. Yes. Uh, and that's not really a bad guess. It's, it, it, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, the 50s were something of a, many people call a golden age in automobiles. Mm -hmm. It was. But have you heard the expression, safety Nazis? Have you no, heard I had never have heard, you heard about the, that. You haven't heard the expression, the environmental Nazis? No. Okay, mm -hmm. well we have something going on in this country today that we have to deal with. It's groups of people who are very well intended and they really want the best for everyone mm -hmm. that thinks that in order to achieve that, that we have to limit and restrict the freedoms of lots of folks. And one of the things that's happened in the past 20 years or so is that the automobiles have become more and more restricted. The manufacturers are not really allowed to produce the kind of cars they'd like to produce, and certainly not for the enthusiasts like those of us mm -hmm. and people who would be watching Motorsports Unlimited. We call these folks safety Nazis, and we call them uh, environmental Nazis be for the reason being that it's not just enough, it seems, for them to be for or against something and conduct themselves that way. They want to inflict those views on the rest mm -hmm. of us, and we fight that very hard. But in the 50s, if we can contrast it for a moment, in the 50s the cars were relatively unrestricted and it's when the real excitement in automobiles began. Uh, boy, one could go back, maybe it started in 55 when Chevrolet first came out with their V8 uh, to match Ford's V8. Maybe it could be best traced back to 57 where mm -hmm. Chevrolet offered fuel injection and Ford countered with the McCullough supercharger and it was pretty exciting and it went on and on. There were bigger mega engines in cars all the time. And for enthusiasts like us, it was a very exciting period Probably, in my opinion, and I argue all the time yeah, with folks like John Platania on our crew, um, I always feel that th I think there are two eras. There's the era from 1957 to 1965 that I call the supercars, mm -hmm. where they were literally unrestricted as far as the kinds of carburation they could have and fuel injection and all the rest of it. Uh, and they, there weren't any emission requirements and what have you. So we had some pretty stunning motors. They were literally race car motors. They felt different and all, and all that. And then John Platania would argue that, say, from 1966 mm -hmm. to 19. No, maybe 71 or something like that. He felt that that was the muscle car era where... What does that mean, muscle car okay, era? It, it, is a, it is a subtle difference, but the difference mm -hmm. is up until 1965, the factories were free to do pretty much what they wanted to do, and the engines had literally full race cams and all the rest of it, which would be too hard to explain right mm -hmm, here, but the, yeah. motors, the motors were literally like race car engines. After that, the government restricted them rather seriously. So in order to get the same amount of power, they made the engines bigger and bigger and bigger in order to get the same amount of power that they were getting from, I don't want to say the smaller engines, these uh -huh. engines weren't exactly small, but for example, if we had a 426 or a 427 engine, now the factory came up with a 455 engine or a 460 engine, something on the, to compensate for what they had to give up for the breathing restrictions and all that in order to meet emission requirements. Those cars are called muscle cars. Now after that period went mm -hmm. by, the government clamps came down even harder so that you couldn't even really have the big engines and all that. So, so why? Why don't they, why did they restrict of the people well, to build they the cars? They restricted it with the best of intentions. Like everyone else uh, in this world, uh, we're going to save these folks from themselves. It was from the best of intentions. There are people that believe firmly. They are incorrect, mm -hmm. but they believe firmly that the road to good health and prosperity in America is to make sure that we have cars that get 30 and 40 miles to the gallon, that don't pollute the environment and the rest of it. They are, they are in, okay. there's, there is nothing wrong, please understand, there is nothing wrong with the goals they are trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is those goals are not really achievable on the paths that they're taking. And worse than that, taking those paths, taking us down those paths, prevents folks like us from really legitimately achieving the goals that they would like to achieve. It's a little too complicated for right now, yeah, but I just wanted I to give you an idea okay, of why yeah. the, fi the 50s were important, mm -hmm. because it was an unrestricted period. It was real excitement. You had a little touch of it there. The interstate highway system was, was just finished around 55 mm -hmm. or so, having begun in the early 50s. So 
it was kind of the golden age, and everybody in the automobile field, they like to reach back to that 50s period. It was fun. We enjoyed I it. We had a good okay. time. Yeah. Now, I want to do, now, the, what did you think of the car show, by the way? And, and again, we could spend, I don't have the time, <laughs> yeah, you know, I but we, I could, I would love, one day maybe we'll have to do a whole show just talking to you, because I can't imagine what <laughs> you must think of all this going on, just being from yeah. China, from a little town that had no cars. This has really got to be some kind of a culture shock to you. But what did you think of the car show and all that? I think it's really interesting. I really enjoyed being there, and I really uh, saw the people could get together, and not only, you know, by w uh, seeing the cars there, but just for the people to get together and, uh, you know, to see the communities together. Good, good point. <laughs> Speaking of get, getting together, did you notice that they had the, did you see the, any of the hula hoop contest? You know what a hula hoop is? Yeah, yeah. Did, did, do you know what hula hoop is in China? No. Okay, but, uh, but you saw them with the hoop? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's roll just a little bit of that footage right now. Folks, uh, don't go away. We're going to be right back. I want you to see that there's more to a car uh -huh. show than just looking at cars, although that's plenty of fun in and of, of itself. These are great cars. But there's a lot of other things going on, like the music and the band. Yes. And they run little contests. And let's take just a little bit of the, of the footage of the hula hoop contest. <laughs> But I already picked out a winner. Well, that's hard. Man, this is. Where's John Belly? John. Did you have hula hoops or anything like that no. in uh, in China? Nothing like that. So that's mm -hmm. all new to you. Yeah. Have you ever tried a hula hoop? No. Oh no. boy, I wish I'd known that. We'd had you doing the hula hoop in a second. It's actually fun and it's real easy to do. In addition to the hula hoop contest, they also had a '50s dance contest. Did you notice any of that? No, not really. But I I did notice they have a band there where. They, they play the music. Well, the a DJ, music. right. Yeah. And, and then they also had a, like a 50s dance contest there too. And again, the 50s, once again, is a certain motif. Mm -hmm. The girls always wore what they called poodle skirts, felt skirts. They had a poodle on it. They were like charcoal gray with a pink poodle oh, and all that. That, was, sure that, that was part that. of the era, you know. And uh, let's just go ahead and roll this. And this is TV magic stuff. You're not going to really see this. But you know, <laughs> okay. when we come back, we're going to pretend like you did. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh, folks, let's take a little, bit, a little look at the 50s dance contest. <laughs> Did you know that we had a specific era in our society that had specific yes. kinds of dancing and all yes. that? You did, because you are a dancer, right? Yeah, I know a little bit. Okay, so really know. And, and that was the period of the jitterbug. Have you heard that expression for a dance? I, I did jitterbug when I was in New Mexico. Okay, well, that's the 50s. That's <laughs> uh, what the jitterbug is. That's the 50s. Uh, one other thing that I want to do, and then we've got to get back to our footage. First uh -huh. of all, Gee, well, I can't do it because we're out of time, but yeah. there's so many things I'd like to talk to you about as far as your impressions and how things are different and all that. But one of the things that we did, you brought a camera with you when we did the car yes. show, and you had me take pictures of you, buy the cars and all that, uh -huh. right? And you said you're going to send them back to your mother in China. Yes. Now, first of all, our audience should know that her mother lives in an area of China where they don't have telephones, so she doesn't get to call her mother, and she has to write to her, and her mother only reads and, and writes Chinese, right? The yes. Chinese symbols Chinese. and all that. Uh. Now, I want our audience to kind of picture her mother getting these pictures of Li Chen and this house with these custom cars. Mind you, this is a town that has no cars at all. So now, I don't know how you could explain this in Chinese symbols. It's going to take like 10 pages. Yeah, I will try my best. <laughs> so I, I won't scare my mother. Yeah. Wait, what is she doing what in America? She doing? Yeah. going to send the, the Chinese mafia back here to get you yeah, and take you back probably. to China. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, and one last thing now is what we did here is that we actually gave you the microphone and had you start an interview, right? Yes. Now, what did you think of that? I enjoyed it. Was it hard or easy? No, it's not very hard at all. You just have to be a human being, you know, just... Uh, to interview or talk to another person. Okay, well, in a minute, I think we've got, I think first we've got uh, Tracy O'Toole's interview coming up, and mm -hmm. I think yours fo follows that. I'm not sure how we're doing this, but it's coming up in a few minutes, uh, and we'll give a, ch a chance to see Li Chen and her first interview. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Folks, uh, I thought you'd enjoy meeting Lee Chin and learning a little bit more about her, and hopefully as Lee Chin participates with us, you'll come to know a, a whole lot more about her. Uh, don't go away. We've got a lot more of the Oak Brook Terrace Car Show for you. Thanks, Bill. 
Now let's get back to the cars with Tracy O'Toole making her debut as an interviewer. Can you tell me your name? Sure, my name's Bob Morton. And can you tell me where you're from? Villa Park, Illinois. And can you tell me something about your car? Well, it's the first year for 427 Biscaynes. A Chevy, ever, uh, Chevy built for 425 horsepower car. It's kind of a very rare car. Okay, thank you. I think we'll have to have Bill in here. I didn't hear. How did she do? Fine. Your name was? Bob Morton. Bob, you've got a really, really rare piece here. This must have been the first year with the 427s? Right, it was. Okay, do you recall, I was just asking somebody earlier, uh, do you recall if they had a 409 that became a 425 cubic inch displacement engine? No, they never did. You're sure? Yes. Okay, cause it seems, I'm remembering from 30 years ago, seems to me that they went, I know they went 409, 409, then 425 horse 409, and I thought they went to a 425. 427. They made it into a 427. The 409 motor? Right. Okay, but with the scallop valve covers before they went to this? Right. So it was 427 cubic inches, 425 horsepower? 30. Four, 30, they rated it. 430. Okay, this one, original? Yes. Everything? Yes. Did you build it or did it? was it in nice condition and kept that way? No, it was that, uh, we kind of purchased the car this way. Okay, let me ask you a question. You appear to be about my age. I'm 47 years old. Why? I had them when I was younger. I had a lot of 409s. Uh, it just gets in your blood and you can't get it out. It's just... Are you a mechanic? No, I'm not. It's just... You, ju you just like them and there's something about having this stuff from your younger days that right. you find pleasurable? Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to put my finger on it. We'll be asking more folks those questions, but I think that's something that the public would be interested in is, is to exactly what would motivate and compel us to, to collect. And, I mean, there's a lot of money sitting here. What is something like this worth? Uh, it's just $21,000 in a car. Yeah, a lot of money sitting here, and apparently you get enough out of it to justify it. Well, <laughs> for myself, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, what does your wife say? Uh, uh, anyhow, folks, I thought you really had to see this. It's a very special piece. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Now, that wasn't very hard, was it? Wasn't that easy? Oh, it was just great. <laughs> <laughs> It's Lee Chen's turn now as she tries to find out about Art Karslinka's taste in cars. Art Kozlenka from Des Plaines, Illinois. Yeah, I think this is very interesting. Where are you from? I'm from Des Plaines, Illinois. I, um, I know you own both of these cars. Can you tell us something about your cars? Yeah, this uh, red one's a 1940 Chevy Street Rod, and uh, the one I'm next to here is a 1951 Mercury. It's done in a 50s style, mild custom. Yeah, have you spent lots of time for remoting or paint, 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 paint them? Oh yeah, there's a lot of time involved. You're always working on them. I see. Okay, I think I will get uh, Bill to ask some technical okay. questions. Sure. Uh, this has got to be quite a culture shock for Lee Chen. We've been explaining to our audience uh, this entire show that uh, Lee Chen is from uh, Inner Mongolia in China. She's only been here a year and a half and she was from a town that didn't have cars at all. Now, how would you explain a, 50, a customized 51 Merc to Lee Chen? I don't, without having a car in a, I couldn't. Yeah. Just, you know. yeah, it's, it's Lee, it's a little bit about what I wanted to talk to you about, and I hope we're going to have a little time to put it in this show. And if not, we're going to do a lot of car shows this summer. I want to explain it to you again, because the automobile in America is a whole lot more than conveyance from point A to point B. It is literally a part of our culture, and rightfully so, because frankly, the automobile really made America rich. People building them, people designing them, uh, people servicing them, people building highways for them and all that. It really has contributed perhaps more than any other single thing. The automobile has contributed to the wealth of this nation. So we do more than just drive them. We literally celebrate them. 
and we manicure them and we polish them and we modify them and we pamper them. Am I halfway right? You got it. That's it. And from each period of our lives, now a 51 Merc would have been before my period. My period of my teenage years would have been 56, 57, 58, maybe up through 61 when I graduated from high school. That would have been my period. This would have preceded me a little bit. Uh, this would have been like the guys that were dating my sister. They would have been, my sister was five years older than me. One of them had a 50 Merc with remember the little sign, the club sign hanging from the back and all that. Those are different periods of American automotive life, and fellas like this preserve those periods. Uh, I don't want to speak for you. No, you got it. That's it. It's, uh, it's done in early 50s style in uh, James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, that made the Mercs popular. Now, does that mean anything to you, James yeah, Dean, Rebel Without a Cause? I don't think so, but I have a question. Uh, what do you feel when you own a car like this? How, uh, you know, how long have you owned it for? own these cars? I've, I've owned this car for three years. I see. Okay, and uh, the second question I have is, again, this one, you're younger than I am, so this one is uh, surprising you'd be attracted to something like this, but this one is even earlier, which would have been from what we're talking about, 40-ish? Yeah, 1940 Chevy. 40 Chevy. Now, that's from a much earlier period. What would motivate you to have something like both of these are yours? Right. Well, I got, to me, I got the best of both worlds. I got a modern-style street rod in 1940 Chevy, and I'm still lost in the 50s with the Merc. <laughs> you you like the 50s? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, we're gonna again try to explain all of this stuff to our audience as we go through the summer with a variety and and in a way, Lee Chin makes a valuable contribution to our program because as I try to explain it to her, if I think she's getting it, I hope our audience right. is getting it. So that'll be very helpful to us, folks. Don't go away. I think we're gonna look at some antique cars next. We'll be right back. <laughs> Don't get the idea that car shows are just about 409s, 421s, and 427s, whatever that means. Let's join Marilyn Schwartz and see what she found. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Ray Fritz. And where are you from? Burbank, Illinois. Uh, what kind of car is this? It's a 1923 Model T station wagon Woody. It's beautiful. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Sure. It's a four-cylinder. got wooden points. Uh, it's been restored uh, two years ago. Uh, it's all oak wood. Original fenders. It's just been uh, all uh, sprayed and that. The motor's been... Uh, rebuilt and all that and uh, top speed at that time in 23 was uh, 45 but the no more uh, regular gas so we redone the engine and she'll top speed will be 60 miles an hour that's interesting Bill can you get in here <laughs> here he comes nicely done Marilyn that wasn't so hard was it no Marilyn comes all the way to us from Indiana we appreciate her participation very much I said we're gonna I stuck the microphone in her hand so I'm gonna have you do one of these interviews uh, first of all it sounds like you already gave a little of the technical information about the car right yes sir okay what I want our audience to know and I presume you already got his name yeah your name was Ray Fritz Ray uh, I wanted our audience to see the wide variety of things that they can see at one of these car shows that are held in the various communities and at, for that matter car cruising places and things like that yeah, there's the very outrageous uh, T Roadsters and 32 Ford Coupes, hot rods, and there's the 50 Mercs and things like that. But there is also at least a smattering of antiques and antique restorations, and that's what you are, right? Yes, sir. Can you tell me why you do this? Well, number one, keeps you out of the taverns. <laughs> yeah, but watching TV keeps you out of the taverns, too. This is a lot of work and a lot of money. Can you tell me why? Well, you're in the Model Ts, you know antique cars uh something that keeps you busy it's a toy you know but it is expensive in that do you have any others yeah i have a 1930 model a uh, deluxe coupe too so you're strictly a ford man or if that's not yeah. fair say so yeah yeah uh cars are uh, chevys you know that i drive but uh i'm into the fords antiques any particular reason no not really just easy to work on in that yeah, and stuff is kind of readily available for them and all that sort of thing. Yeah, you can uh, get a, for instance, for this, uh, there's a Model T joint, Bob's Antiques in Rockford. 
good parts there and there's a couple Model A joints in the Elk Grove displays that you can get parts right away too. Okay, now let me talk to your friend over here who's not going to have such an easy time getting parts. I'm sure you'd agree. Okay. Now, can you tell us your name, sir? Jim Allen. Now, Jim, we were just talking to your uh, friend next door here, and he was telling us how it's nice to work with the Fords because the parts are easy to get. You can still, there are still some people that manufacture new old parts for them. You've got a Chandler here. I'm guessing that's not the case with them. Not hardly. Hard to find parts. Very hard, very hard. First of all, tell us about the cars as far as I don't know the year and model of these pieces. The year of the car is a 1927 and a half Chandler. Okay, now wait, let me step on the side of you because, uh, and we can tell our cameraman to keep panning because this one is also, uh, this is a Model A Ford? That's right, that's a reproduction. That car was built. This is a repo? That's a repo. That was built in 1980 by Shea Reproduction. Boy, it fooled me, it is beautifully done. Well, thank you, we try to take care of it. What kind of engine? Uh, it's got a Ford Pinot drive in it. The whole drive line is Ford Pinot? That's right. Okay, very nicely done. Tell us a little more about the Chandler, though. Well, we got the Chandler here. This Chandler was uh, made in Cleveland, Ohio. And an Indian purchased the car brand new and drove it into Vermilion Bay, Ontario. And uh, kind of a funny story behind that. Uh, the Indian owed a 40, or 50, I'm sorry, $50 bar bill. And the guy I bought it off from, he got it for 50 bucks. Of course, I had to pay a little more for it. I was going to say, I'll give you 100 well, I might take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you'll take me up on it. <laughs> By the way, Bob Hope, uh, his first job when he came to this country was working on the assembly line for Chandler. I have a question for you that I, that I, I just asked your friend over here. There's all kinds of different ways to participate in motorsport, and, and clearly restoring antique automobiles is one of those ways. But, and I ask other folks, I ask people to do indie cars, and I ask people to do uh, stock cars, and I want to ask somebody that does uh, restorations. Why? Well, I don't know. I like the old stuff. I'm not a young man myself. I like to get into something that's different. And I think the Chandler was quite a different automobile. I could no longer find parts for it. So I had to uh, really look. Did a lot of looking for the parts that I needed, which was very few. And if I needed something, I had the old parts. So we went to the machine shop and got it duplicated. Okay, I want to find out now, if you excuse me, i got to find, we've got a girl from China, as we, and I'm going to stop saying that, she's going to be mad if I keep doing that. Uh, I want to find out, she sat in the other one, now do we have a camera shot or are we in her way? I guess we can do it. Lee Chin, this one is quite different from the 30 Ford uh, sedan you were sitting in, the hot rod. This one's quite different, isn't it? Yeah, it is very different. It seems the, the other one I sat on, um, you know, they put lots of modern things in it. This is like, it seems they keep the original things. That, that's exactly correct. This is, an, this is a restoration. This is an exact original. Uh, everything has been, in fact, th they get graded on how uh, accurate they are in keeping the car absolutely original rather than putting modern drive on. This is just another kind of motorsports. And again, this must be very puzzling to somebody from China that doesn't have any cars. Yeah, it is. It, but I really enjoyed being here. It's, it's lots of fun. Yeah, we do know how to have fun in this country. Yeah. That, we, that we do. Okay, uh, we've got more cars to look at. Um, folks, again, I want you to know that there are all kinds of uh, different vehicles at, uh, at these car shows, and there's something literally for everyone. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hot rods, customs, antiques, the variety of vehicles is as varied as the people that attend car shows. Let's move back to the 50s and meet Don Zambiuto and his collection of Mopar magic. <laughs> Well, we have certainly found a rare bird here. First of all, can you tell us your name? Don Zambuto. Where are you from, Don? Villa Park. Don, tell us about your car. Well, it's a 58 Dodge Super Red Ram 500. It's uh, a custom royal body style. Matter of fact, again, I hesitate to admit it, but I'm old enough to remember these things very well. This was Dodge's version of Plymouth's Golden Commando engine? Yeah, it is. Uh, it was the answer to the Chrysler 300, too. Okay, but what a lot of people don't really realize is that they had dual quads on these engines. Right. It's got dual quads. They featured fuel injection, and they had a little problem with fuel injection, and they went to the dual quads. 
Right now, did any of the Dodges have the Hemi engine? Uh, Not in 58. 57 was the last year for the Hemi. Okay, because I'm just trying to recall as to when they, because I know the, the, the later Hemi was 64. Well, yeah, they went back to the Hemi, but for uh, Dodge in the 50s, 57 was their last Hemi, went to 58, and then in the, uh, just Chrysler had Hemis. Right, what, what people don't remember very well is because when you think of like 57, 58, you do think, of course, of Chevys and, and Fords, but Chrysler had a hot motor too. Oh, they sure did. They had a lot hotter motors. Okay, well, listen, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us. Uh, do you make a lot of car shows? Oh, I make try to make every one I can, mostly Mopars. Wait a minute, I was just going to say, matter of fact, um, somebody stuck a thing in my pocket here. Are you involved in Mopar Mania, August, yeah. August 18th and 19th at the Oakbrook Terrace Tower? Right, I'll be there. Okay, is that, again, uh, Oakbrook Terrace sponsored, the community? Yes, it will be. Okay. Well, it will be sponsored by Mopar Mania in... Uh, I don't know if it's Oakbrook Terrace that'll be doing it. Okay, now that's strictly Chrysler Corporation right. cars. Mopar okay, cars. okay. Well, that'll be uh, certainly fun, and I'm glad to see Chrysler Corporation get a little oh, recognition. Yeah. Well, just to let you know, I got my whole family here, and you got a whole Mopar Alley here, right there. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you're right. And perhaps we can get our cameraman to do a nice slow pan here to close this thing. Uh, there's a Plymouth Fury, and it looks like what's uh, what's oh, the 440 at the end? That's a GTX Plymouth GTX. Okay, see if you can make that nice pan shot. Uh, folks, don't go away. We'll be right back, and let's close on a shot. These are all three years. Well, mine and my two sons, they're all here. That's yeah, just like being yours, right? You can take it away from them if you want to, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> have more to show you, but that's all we have time for this week. In two weeks, we'll bring you the rest of the Oakbrook Terrace Car Show, including Dennis Canelli's sensational 48 Anglia that Subi Itzenthaler said she would sell her mother for. I would sell my mother for this car. She doesn't know it yet, though. We also visited with one of the largest street rod clubs in Chicago, Street Machines, Chicago style. See you, See you next, next week. week. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from Merlin Muffler and Brake Shop, located in Franklin Park on Mannheim Road between Grand and Fullerton. A special thank you to Audition News for helping us locate Chicago area talent to lighten and brighten our program. This program made possible in part by support from Auto Magic Body Shop located in Franklin Park. Hi, this is Carl King. We'd like to thank our ever important crew members Paul Marchese, Chris Carter, Mohinder Rekala, John Platania, Chris Schutz, Bill Moore. Chuck Itzenthaler and Joe Courtney. A special thanks to Fireside Recording Studio in Westchester, Illinois. Thanks, guys. And our Crusaderettes, Angie K, Tracy O'Toole, Subi Itzenthaler, Lee Chen, Joy Theus, Marilyn Schwartz, Cameo St. John, Lyle Ann Seeger. The Motorsport Advancement Crusade is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and enhancement of motorsport. We are entirely funded by voluntary contribution. For more information, you can write Motorsport, or you can write the whole thing if you'd like, Motorsport Advancement Crusade, but mail us to us just fine, addressed Motorsport. P.O. Box 66242, Chicago, Illinois 60666, or just call at 1-312-478-4224. We enjoy hearing from our audience and we encourage you to call or write. Until next week, I'm Ann Fuller. Thank you for watching. <laughs>